Hello everyone! In this video, I'm going to terraform the dwarf planet Pluto. That is, Pluto will first of all become a full-fledged planet, and secondly, life will emerge on it. All of this will be demonstrated using the Universe Sandbox Simulator. Let's go! Pluto is an object from the Kuiper Belt. In other words, this dwarf planet is quite far from the Sun, and to terraform it, we need to recreate a red giant, which I just did with the Sun. In the distant future, the Sun will turn into a red giant, and the habitable zone will shift all the way out to Pluto's orbit, so now Pluto can be safely and effectively terraformed there. And first, let's take a look at its mass. Its mass is very small, just 17% of the Moon's mass. I'll increase its mass using asteroids. In this simulator, you can easily grab these very small random rocky particles, and I'll launch these actual objects to collide with the dwarf planet Pluto. Watch how they crash into it. These celestial objects don't cause any significant harm to Pluto. I don't really know precisely why it's like that, but I consistently use them to effectively increase the overall mass of these objects. So look closely. I launch these asteroids at this specific mark, and Pluto's mass steadily increases, which is exactly what we fundamentally need. So I'll bring the mass up to more or less reasonable values, and then we'll continue. As a result, I brought the mass up to 3.74 times the mass of the Moon, and the radius ended up being almost 0.4 times the radius of the Earth. As we can see, clouds are already starting to form on Pluto. I guess that's nitrogen being released. Well, now I'll fast forward time, let the temperature stabilize, and then we'll continue. Time has passed, and Pluto has become like this, acquiring a very dense atmosphere. The average temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Let's hide the atmosphere and clouds. This is what the surface looks like now. So, what do we see in the atmospheric composition? There's a lot of water vapor and a lot of nitrogen. Basically, it's a water-nitrogen atmosphere here. And there's also a little bit of methane. And the pressure is over 30 atmospheres, which is very bad. So I'll have to somehow knock Pluto's atmosphere off its surface. To do this, I'll take Ceres and launch it tangentially in that direction, increasing the speed of this object by a hundred times. 127 kilometers per second, that's the speed this object will be moving at. Starting the time. I'll show you from this angle. Here comes the dwarf planet Ceres, it's about to hit the distant Pluto tangentially. Oh, that didn't quite work out. It ended up going completely into Pluto. Well, whatever, it should still help, in principle. A lot of fragments flew out. As I speed up time, some of them will fall back down. Now there's this huge cloud here from the collision. I'll delete all these fragments, and the simulator shows that active evaporation of substances is happening. And what we can already see is that only water vapor remains in the atmosphere. All the nitrogen has apparently escaped into space. As I speed up time even more, we can see that even all the water on Pluto's surface has disappeared. Well, that's just a little bit okay, we'll add it back then later. Pluto has cooled down, but now there's another problem. The tilt of its rotation axis is 158 degrees, and a day on Pluto is now almost 4 hours. Pluto is now spinning around its axis very quickly. I'm going to launch asteroids in that direction to slow down the rotation. Now look at this marker. Here I go launching them, and little by little the length of the day is slowing down. I also need to launch them like this, so that the tilt of the axis improves as well. In the end, guys, I set the axial tilt to 17.8 degrees, and the day on Pluto will be just over 25 hours. Let's check the orbit around the Sun. Here's Pluto's orbit. And as you can see, I think the eccentricity has increased, which is bad. Yes, that's right. An eccentricity of 0.42 is a lot. I'll make this eccentricity a bit smoother. Let it be around 0.2. Next, I'll create a magnetic field for Pluto, setting its magnetic field strength to 1 Gauss. And now Pluto has a nice strong magnetic field. And by the way, I forgot to mention, take a look at how Pluto's appearance changed after that massive collision with Ceres. Well, I had to do it that way. Now the simulator shows that there's a slight atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide and water vapor, but the concentration is very low. As you can see, I've launched three asteroids. Each asteroid contains its own elements and time is passing at 1 minute per second. This one is a nitrogen object, this one is a water object, and this one is an oxygen object. Now together, they're going to deliver the necessary elements for both liquid water and the formation of an atmosphere. Wow, what collisions. I'll make it brighter so we can take a closer look. And now we can see the gases starting to spread. That's nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen will appear kind of greenish-white, I guess. And oxygen can be seen as this purple color. And now it looks like vegetation is starting to appear. Incredible! By the way, look over here. On Cetius, we have essential oxygen. There's also carbon dioxide, a little bit of water vapor, and some nitrogen. We'll carefully check later if these crucial elements are truly enough. If not, it's certainly never too late to thoughtfully add more. I'll hide the atmosphere and clouds. Let's see what's on the surface. Yes, as we can see, there's already some kind of life belt forming. Well, that's how Universe Sandbox works. If the conditions for life are present, it appears right away. As for the surface pressure, it shows 0.65 atmospheres. But as we can see, the reading is dropping. 
but here in the impact zones the temperature is 726 degrees. We need to fast forward time so that the temperature stabilizes. The planet has cooled down and the area covered by vegetation has even increased, but the atmospheric pressure has now dropped to merely 0.34 atmospheres. Well guys, so we really don't have to wait any longer. I'll now even out all the gases across Pluto's entire surface and also distribute the water evenly throughout. And as I can clearly see, there's actually quite little water present and apparently not much atmosphere either. Yeah, if you look closely here, there's really very little nitrogen. At the very least, we need to add more nitrogen. There's enough oxygen, basically. This time I won't launch asteroids, I'll use another tool in this simulator. This one is the material tool. And here you can simply select water and then set its specific amount. I'll set it to approximately 0.0025 Earth oceans. Well basically we can start now. The water particles are flying. Excellent. Now I'll spread this water across the entire surface. So this is the difference between water and land that we get. But I think I need to add more. So I'm launching even more water particles now. There they fell down. I'm carefully evening out the water across the entire surface, and this is precisely what we get. Here you can see islands. I'll hide the atmosphere and clouds so you can see in more detail. Well, there you can see these little islands. I want to make a planet like this, mainly so that water dominates here. And I also need to remember to add nitrogen, because there wasn't enough nitrogen. The nitrogen has been added. As you can see, this dark spot was created by liquid nitrogen, which has now fallen onto Pluto's surface as a liquid, but it will soon evaporate into the atmosphere and make it richer. Nine chi. Why? I'm speeding up time? Let's see how this process unfolds. Now the concentration of nitrogen in the atmosphere is increasing while it's evaporating from the oceans. And as a result, the pressure reached 0.94 atmospheres. That's close to one atmosphere, which is basically perfect. But now, so we absolutely don't have to wait any longer, I'll carefully equalize all the gases evenly and uniformly, and thanks to that, all the vast continents and numerous islands on Pluto have completely turned a vibrant green. That's truly and remarkably cool. Now I'll also equalize the water again, just in case. And let me show you the truly incredible atmosphere on the display. This is precisely how wonderfully nice Pluto looks now. I've set the time progression in the simulator to 10 days per second. And as you can see, the temperature is dropping, so we still have a problem with the temperature, and we need to solve it. Here in the simulator, it clearly says that Pluto has only one single atmospheric layer. But since I added atmospheric density and also added oxygen, I think it's quite reasonable to set the number of atmospheric layers to about three. Now I'll speed up time and let's see if the temperature will start to go in the other direction. I've set the simulator time to one month per second and as we can see, yes, the average temperature is already four degrees below zero and I think it will definitely go above zero. And the maximum temperature at the equator is already 10 degrees Celsius. As a result, the average temperature on Pluto settled at four degrees Celsius and the maximum temperature at the equator is 21 and a half degrees. Well, that's still a bit too cold. I'd like to make it a bit warmer. There's also a parameter here called average albedo. And by the way, the simulator doesn't adjust it automatically. Let me explain what average albedo is. This is how much sunlight a given planet can retain on its surface. In other words, the lower this value, the more sunlight the planet can retain, and accordingly, the warmer it will get. So I'll set this value to about 0.40. Now take a look at what we've got as a result. The average temperature is almost 15 degrees Celsius, and the maximum at the equator is 36 degrees, with even the minimum temperature at the poles being around 8 degrees. Now I'll add Pluto's native moons, as well as the second component of the double planet system, Charon. But here it will act as a moon, because Pluto's mass has become much greater. In fact, you can now see the orbits of these moons. Everything is rotating as it should. Pluto besides Charon also has four other moons, making a total of five. I would also change something else about Pluto, specifically its atmospheric visualization. For example, you can add an Earth-like haze, just like Earth's atmosphere. This way, it will probably look very much better and truly more realistic. Now I will descend to the surface of one of its many islands, and we will see what the sun, a red giant star, looks like from there. This is precisely how bright our sun appears. But that's because I enabled the human eye mode. If you switch to this mode, the sun of course is barely visible. Now I will also descend to the dark side and let's see how Charon looks here, in the night sky from Pluto. And here we can see it clearly. I've also successfully landed on the surface of Charon, and this is precisely how a fully terraformed Pluto looks from its surface. Truly incredible. As a result, we have a planet with a mass almost three times that of the Moon and a radius of 0.36 that of Earth's. A year on such a planet lasts 226 Earth years, and a day on Pluto is just over 25 hours long. The average temperature is approximately 14 degrees Celsius. The surface pressure is just under one full atmosphere, and the probability of finding life is about 
Yes, it's not very high, but as we can see, the continents are green, so everything seems fine. And if you look at the dark side of Pluto, you can see the lights of night cities. So, life really does exist there. There's your proof. That's how I terraformed Pluto. Overall, it turned out quite interesting, and Pluto looks more attractive than before. Wouldn't you agree? If you liked it, give it a like and let me know what you think about terraforming Pluto. Maybe you would have terraformed it a bit differently. Share your thoughts in the comments. Thank you very much for watching this video, and we hope to see you again in the vast universe.